All right, switching gears as we do, we are transitioning to a very local issue, but a very difficult issue. We are, um, I think we're, we're the national um, kind of center for prairie tree yes, research, we are. aren't we? Yeah. Yes, we have been for a long time. All right. And it's cool. a good segue talking about politics into science because most of my reports go to the Texas Comptroller's office, um, <laughs> not other scientists, um, since this species is very uh, politically sensitive because like Catherine said when she in introduced the, the topics today, um, almost every facet of our regional society is influenced by the persistence of the species. So this research project that I'm talking about today is a continuation of a long-term project we've had since 2008. And to get into the specifics, if you guys haven't seen prairie chickens in a scientific publication or lesser prairie chickens or in a presentation, you haven't seen the real thing. The mass media usually puts stock photos of greater prairie chickens or or other uh, poultry. So this is what a lesser prairie chicken looks like. The top photo is a male in his display and the female uh, attending a lek. So what is a lek and what is this species all about? Well, this species is um, a prairie grouse species. So this is the distribution through four ecoregions that occurs on the southern Great Plains. It has a cousin, the greater prairie chicken that occurs in tall grass prairies and the Atwaters prairie chicken that occurs just south of Houston in, a, in basically a, a zoo. Um, and this species is best known for its flamboyant display, its courtship display, and you can see in the top photo the male is actually displaying for the females. And their reproductive uh, behavior is known as leg def defense polygyny. So what happens in the springtime, and this is what attracts bird watchers and everybody from uh, around the world, is that a lot of these little guys will form uh, courtship rituals on a given area and they will defend territories from each other uh, in hopes of gaining her attention so they mate. And that is their, that's it. When they mate with a the female, they are done. And the female takes over the reproductive uh, duties for the species and she uh, forms the nest, lays the eggs, incubates the eggs, and then raises the chicks through the, pretty much the fall. So that's the important thing because females are solely responsible for the breeding uh, duties. It turns out that population persistence of this species is primarily driven by her ability to incubate eggs and raise the chicks. The males are kind of, there's almost a surplus of males if you have more than five in a given area. Um, you know, you, you suffer genetically, but females are the important ones. Lesser prairie chickens are very unique in that they can adapt to various vegetation structure uh, throughout their distribution. And we characterize their vegetation structure now into four distinct ecoregions. We have the Shinri Oak Prairies, which is this, this red section here, this is where chickens in Texas and New Mexico mainly exist. And then as you go north, you get into different types of grassland and prairie systems. Uh, so the, the orange is mixed grass prairie, the green is sand sage prairie, and then the purple up in Kansas, and it should be Nebraska by this point, uh, are short grass prairies. So at the, at the vegetation structure, it's very different. There's grasses, there's shrubs, there's various species. But what's really amazingly consistent about this species is, although the plant species differ uh, some bit, the structures in which they place their nest is amazingly consistent throughout the distribution of the species. So we, we characterize uh, nest by certain man-made uh, objective quantities, so visual obstruction, how much biomass is around the nest, canopy cover, things like that. From all the, the studies that we've ever been done on lesser prairie chickens, which there's been numerous, it's one of the most studied species in this region and probably nationwide, um, that nest structure and the areas they choose to raise their chicks is amazingly consistent in terms of composition. Now the species itself may differ. But the important thing to remember here is this dividing line between Shinri Oak Prairies and the rest of the distribution results in a completely different, different life history strategy. So birds in the Shinri Oak Prairies live their lives differently compared to the birds in the northern expanses. And we can't explain that, or we're trying to explain it, and this is what the, the topic of, the, of this presentation is about. So in, the, in ecology, we usually define a life history strategy as you know, species, they exist to pass down the individual genes. And it's usually a trade-off of survival, how long they survive and how many young they, they reproduce. Either they live a long time and go for it one shot, or they die trying numer the, uh, as many times as they possibly can. Now, what's interesting is in Shinrigo Prairies, uh, females and males live a lot longer. As you 
compared to the northern expanses, but they reproduce very, uh, not nearly as much. They usually have one nest per year, they don't re-nest, and the number of eggs they produce uh, per nest is drastically reduced from birds in the northern expanses of their range. Uh, conversely, as you go north, the birds live just like, for example, a female survival would probably be two to three years. In the south, it's four to five years. But they have more eggs per nest, and they, um, they reproduce more often, they have more re-nest attempts. So there's a trade-off between these life history strategies. Um, so what we're trying to explain is why is there a difference in this life history strategy? What's different about the south compared to the north? And does this contribute to our, our knowledge of how environmental variation influenced species persistence? And the answer is yes, the shinry oak prairies are much hotter and much drier. So the graph or the figure on your left is the temperature gradient as you go south to north. So it's much hotter down here compared to the northern distribution. And then conversely, the precipitation gradient as you go from left to right, there's much more precipitation on the eastern border of the species distri uh, distribution. And it's already well known in ecology that, that um, the animals living on the edge of their distribution are usually at their physiological tolerance. And what happened in 2009 is this project was originally designed to assess the effects of wind energy on, on population persistence. Well, the wind farm backed out because this is really sandy soil and they were having trouble building the infrastructure. But in 2009, what I noticed was, um, was we had a week in May where temperatures were above 100 degrees for, for five or six days and relative, relative humidity was really low. And all the, all the nests were just abandoned. They were just left. So I got to thinking like, well, does the short term, you know, environmental spikes, our heat, heat spike, our cold snap, or a cold snap conversely, would that influence the probability of a nest surviving the incubation period? And that's important because the females contribute to population persistence. So if there is some sort of environmental driver in nest survival, that would influence population persistence. And that was the topic of my dissertation was that we know in Shinrio prairies that when birds, or when it's in drought conditions, the birds do not respond well. And with more drought in the future, we can uh, quantify the probability of population persistence, which drops considerably in the Shinrio prairies. But given those uh, temperature, temperature and precipitation gradients, what we wanted to do next, uh, next and what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to assess is, are, the, are there the same concerns for lesser prairie chickens in the northern ex expanses, given that there's completely different environmental conditions? And this is the baseline assessment to develop kind of a population demographic model to assess which, which life history parts, is it survival, chick survival, nest survival, is more important to population persistence and do uh, temperature and relative humidity and precipitation drive any of these things across the range. And my grad students over here are going to be doing the, the long-term uh, influence of landscape and, and climate change on lesser prairie chickens. This is just the baseline assessment. So what I wanted to do was, is something very similar to what I did for my dissertation was we wanted to assess if microclimate conditions at the nest, one, what were they across the range of the species? And two, do those environmental conditions actually drive nest survival, like we know for Shinri Oak Prairies? So we're still at, within the first year of this assessment at the range-wide level. And, uh, we're working with Kansas State and Oklahoma State and New Mexico State um, to do this, but the long-term plan is to collect long-term interannual variation environmental conditions as well as um, expand it over into Colorado as well as to uh, further southwest into New Mexico. So we collected data at NEST in nine counties in the various ecoregions. You can see the, the furthest one is up in, in Kansas and the number one is around the city of Hayes just to the west a little bit. And then you have two, three, or four which are in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then you have these areas. This is uh, Six, seven, eight, nine. You have uh, Cochrane is six, uh, Yoakum is eight, Terry is seven, and nine is Hockley. So he's just to the west of us here. And with this is field data. These aren't these aren't models. So here's how I collected these data. So the first thing you have to do is you have to, to catch the female prairie chickens, which is tough enough because they only come to the lek to check out the males about two weeks out of the year. So you have to be really sneaky and really fast, and which we were actually really good at. Uh, and then once you catch them, and if you want to know the size of a prairie chicken, it's like a football. Just imagine like when they spike you a football and you go to 
about that size, uh, but they're a lot tougher um, and they're feisty. So what we do is we put a radio tag on each female and we can follow her movements. And the way these animals uh, or the females have their nest is they lay an egg a day until the entire clutch is set. And then they will incubate all the eggs at once to ensure synchronous hatching so they can leave the nest and go raise uh, their young. So what we do is we follow her around on a daily basis. Now during the incubation or during the nesting period, we follow them a lot more closely. So that's my field crew looking for a nest. And what will happen is once she gets all of her eggs set, she will start incubating eggs. And she will do so for about 28 to 35 days. So once we know that she's on her nest, we can just walk right up to her. And 2008, I did this by myself as a PhD student here at Tech. And I, I'm glad no one there was with me because I have a very high-pitched scream. And they won't move <laughs> unless you boot them off the nest a little bit. Um, the, the first time one jumped up in my face and I screamed and just imagine me dancing around the prairie with my arms full. <laughs> uh, so this bottom picture is actually a picture of a hen on her nest, if you can see. Uh, this, uh, so this is a very cool evolutionary adaptation. Lesser prey chickens nest in residual grasses, so the growing season grasses from the last year. That's why they're brown and not green. So you can see her tiger stripe back right here and then all the residual grasses around her. But what I did was I placed an I-button data logger inside the nest and then maybe right outside the nest. And I compared temperature and relative humidity for all the nest. Um, and what I did was I derived parameters. I didn't use the raw data. And for each ecoregion, I characterized what I thought based on the species ecology is actually important given that the hen is incubating the eggs and in, is actually facing environmental consequences associated with temperature and relative humidity. So mixed grass prairie, shinri oak prairie, and short grass prairie. So I want to point down here because I'm short. Um, but I characterized these, these different variables for each nest. So you have average daytime temp, uh, average daytime relative humidity, average nighttime temp, relative humidity. And then these down here are combinations of recordings. So hot and dry is when the temperature was greater than 40 degrees C, which is really hot, and less than 20 degrees relative humidity. And you can already see that uh, short grass prairie and mixed grass prairie have very little of these readings compared to Shinrio prairie. It's hotter and drier down here. And then you have some other variables here. And what we really know is that when it's hot, it's not humid. It's hot and dry. And then when it's cold, it's not cold and dry. It's usually cold and humid, especially as you go north. But to characterize these things as you go out, Shinrio prairies are much less humid, uh, warmer, and experience more environmental variation. And now that's partially a result that we measured more years, and that's why we want to expand this assessment out into further years. But the real important question is, do, do these variables at the nest actually influence the probability of the nest surviving? If it's not important, we don't have to worry about climate change in the future because there's some other something on the ground or in the system that explains nest survival better. And here are the results. Now, what is this big table with all these numbers? Well, this is information theory, and it's a very... Uh, natural resource uh, kind of defines statistical philosophy where you uh, characterize descriptive data. Now, this, we don't have true control replicates and treatments. Uh, you can design studies this way, but in this case, this is a truly descriptive study. So all I'm trying to do is rank these models based on the least amount of information loss given the data. So here's the results. And don't buy into all the numbers, but all I want to point out is that for the five top ranking models, relative humidity was the most uh, important predictor of nest survival across the range. Um, now, the intercepts for each model differed a little bit by each ecoregion, which says that relative humidity and, and daytime temperature do influence nest survival, but at different intensities. Uh, and daytime and, and nighttime relative humidity were both important. So what we know is that in Shinri Oak Prairies, um, the birds are exposed uh, to more extreme heat and relative humidity conditions compared to hens and short and mixed grass prairie. That's just based on the characteristics of the nest. Uh, despite this finding, nest survival was higher in Shinri Oak Prairies. Why? Let's talk about that life history strategy. We have three years of data from Shinri Oak Prairies compared to one to the other. In 2010, if you can you guys hear here, it was really cool and wet almost the whole year. And every nest we monitored was successful converse to 2011, 
when it was the worst drought on record, and we have evidence that the hens did not even attempt to incubate their eggs, or their eggs were already dead by the time they got to their nest. Uh, and in 2012, which was another interesting year, it was cool and wet, which caused incubation to occur earlier, and then a heat spot came and killed all the eggs. So the same, thing, same pattern we saw in 2011. Um, in short grass prairie, the year of assessment, 2013, they were in drought, so they were facing the same kind of conditions we were in 2011, although not as intense. And then in mixed grass prairies, the, uh, the conditions were cool and wet, so they had really high nest survival there. So this supports the hypothesis that the boom-bust pattern, so birds, this, this species, they have a really good reproductive year or a really bad reproductive year. So our data supports uh, this boom-bust life history strategy, but the new information we're adding to this is that relative humidity really plays an important role in this boom. When the boom years, you ha really have abnormal relative humidity as in it's usually higher than compared. Well, what does that matter for a bird that nests on the ground? In the day, if you have really high relative humidity, it prevents uh, egg desiccation and egg death. And during the night, when there's a uh, um, uh, relative humidity, if it's lower, Conversely, you have a reduced risk of olfactory predators, which are the main predators of the nest. So the overall goal of this and what we really need to do in the future is continue this out over the next three or four years, which we are doing, to assess how the birds in the northern expanses respond to microclimate conditions through different years of, of environmental conditions. And then we can make a true claim. But we know for a fact that in Shinri Oak Prairies, relative humidity and temperature and precipitation play a huge role. So 2010, when it was cool and wet, that's a hen on her nest with early grasses. And this photo was taken in early May. It was, uh, it's not residual grasses that year because there was fresh green grass to pick from. This was as early as mid-May. Converse, you have 2011 of this poor gal sitting here in June. This is the vegetation in June. So we know that when in extreme drought year, when relative humidity is really low and the temperatures are really high, they, the nests fail. And that's partially due to exposure, the sun sitting on her back, and the ability to see her from four miles if you're a snake or a coyote or some other predator that eats her. So our preliminary data suggests that, yes, climate change may have a, a substantial impact on this species, but it's more likely to occur at the southern uh, distribution. And this is important because the species is going through candidate status review for the Endangered Species Act. And if we can actually quantify this information for the future, uh, for in, including in all ecoregions, we can actually provide numbers, like what are the thresholds for incubation, what temperature and what relative humidity um, numbers will prevent some of this. We can actually provide some of this information to the, the candidate status and the managers. Uh, but the important thing is you can't do anything about temperature and relative humidity, but you can do things about the plant community. So another part of that assessment is actually looking at the interactive effects of that uh, interactive effects of the structure and the environmental variation uh, on the ground. Because we know even in bad years, some of the nests are successful. So what drives that? And that's where we're heading in the future and what my grad students will be doing. And uh, with that, I will be happy to take any questions. This is a very, there's a lot of acknowledgments, so thank you all. Thank you. We have time for one question. Well, I guess the, uh, the, uh, the difference between the moisture coming from the Gulf of Mexico and coming from the Pacific. Absolutely. Uh, these guys will be doing that. <laughs> what we're going to do, actually what we're going to do is, yeah, we're going to have to, that's why we're working with the Climate Science Center to actually assess what are the long-term patterns that influences seasonal environmental conditions. And, you know, part of it is if you get down into south southwest New Mexico, it's more driven by monsoonal rainfall patterns and things like that. And as you go farther north, you, the Rocky Mountains and the jet stream and all those things. Uh, I don't know where actually your question was going, but yeah, there's there's huge differences in the seasonal drivers of the weather that occur. Are you getting that kind of data? That's yes. Okay. Yep. And that's the type of analysis that we do, looking mm -hmm. at the large scale dynamics and how climate change might affect those, and therefore the moisture fluxes. In fact, Jen He, who is up there, <laughs> um, sitting beside Nancy, that's exactly what she does. Yeah. So we're going to we're actually going to look at. 
climate change with the, the dynamics and the seasonal weather patterns as well as landscape change because we know these birds respond differently to different types of anthropogenic activity and if you have habitat that's connected and undisturbed the birds will do okay. In Kansas in the northern part they're almost since 2000 the numbers have increased almost exponentially because of the enrollment of a conservation reserve program which uh, provides native grasses whereas in some areas like mixed grass prairies the populations are almost declining exponentially because there's more anthropogenic development and we're losing the essential habitat so we you just can't put weather data into these these types of models you also have to assess the influence of, of landscape change so that includes almost everything in existence since the past 50 years which is a nightmare that sounds too easy yeah that's why they're doing it don't I? all right thank you very much thanks guys Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, next month, same time, same place. I don't want to